All right, thanks for having me here. So um, uh, as you already heard in the introduction, um, the work I do really sits between science and engineering. In some sense, it's all about statistics. Um, I'm interested in how the brain and the mind works, and I think it's sort of broadly understood that in some sense, our minds take in data through our senses and we make sense of it somehow. I'd like to understand how that works, and I'd like to be able to build machines that can do that in more human-like ways. So I think a, a starting point, uh, especially in this era of AI, is to recognize that while we have all these things that you could call AI technologies, right, systems that do things that we used to think only humans could do, we don't have any real AI in the sense of the original vision of the field, machines that have a flexible general purpose intelligence like humans, a flexible general purpose way to make sense of data in any one of these domains without having to be specially engineered. So I'd like to understand um, What's the, what's the gap, what's the difference, right? And I think one way to put it is to say, which again, to take sort of a data science statistics um, view on these things, is to say what's, what's been driving recent AI technologies is sophisticated kinds of pattern recognition, right? One thing you can do with data is see patterns in it. But another thing you can do, a deeper thing, is to try to understand it, right? To build models of your world from the data that come in. And that requires looking beyond the data to the, the form and the, and the function of the models. So I'd like to understand all these ways that human intelligence, for example, is about not just recognizing patterns, but explaining and other forms of understanding, imagining, how do we imagine things we've never seen? How do we uh, make plans and solve problems to make those things real? And then how do we build increasingly new models, richer models, combining the ones we have, revising them, and maybe even sometimes building whole new models? Okay. Um, these are hard problems. They're not the kind of things that right now you can engineer at the scale of, say, that Silicon Valley is looking for. Um, it's only, in many ways, only just beginning to be, I would say, an engineering discipline. But I want to give you a little bit of a look forward into the future because I think we're beginning to understand at least the problems we're working on and how to make progress. And I'll talk about two case studies from work in our lab and with our collaborators, um, which each of which I think, again, I, I'd encourage you to contrast this with what you might be most familiar with in, say, the world of pattern recognition or you know, other kinds of statistical problems where, for example, we want to learn new classes, but not in the traditional setting of machine learning classification where you have hundreds or thousands of examples, but maybe just one example. And that's going to require, again, a deeper understanding of both the objects to be classified and what a concept is or what we call common sense scene understanding, where again, in contrast to a lot of things that you might do in computer vision these days, you don't, you're not just trying to see patterns and pixels, but you're trying to make sense of your world in terms of objects and agents. And I'll say a little bit more what I mean, or what we call intuitive physics and intuitive psychology. So as an introduction to one-shot learning, well, you could just, if, if, if you remember what it was like to be a kid learning words, or if you were a parent, um, you've seen this happen all the time on a daily basis where a kid could learn a new word from just one exposure. But in case you forgot what that's like, this is my attempt to try to remind you. Um, raise your hand if you know what this thing is, this thing called a cam. Okay. Um, <laughs> raise your hand if you're a rock climber. Or have, okay, so there's a lot of rock climbers in this audience. Or have maybe seen, raise your hand if you're a rock climber or have seen me give this talk before. Okay. <laughs> well, some of, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, this is a specialized piece of rock climbing equipment. Most people who aren't climbers, uh, haven't seen this, but yet you'd have no difficulty seeing that one, from that one example, looking down here and recognizing these others, right, as instances of the same thing. So how can you do that? Well, I wish I could tell you, this is still too hard for any machine system, and we don't have complete models of how this works in the brain. But we've been studying this by, tr by taking a much simpler version of the problem, inspired by probably many of you ha know or have either worked with, maybe even worked with yourself, the MNIST data set a data set of handwritten digits zero through nine that drove so much of the work in deep learning and other approaches to pattern recognition over the last few decades. So we, have, we built this data set. This is work that Brendan Lake did here at MIT a couple of years ago as part of his PhD um, of, of handwritten characters in many of the world's alphabets, which at the level of the, of the basic data, the basic signals are no more complex than MNIST, roughly 30 by 30 binary pixel arrays. And yet you can recognize in each one of these images here a distinct visual concept. You can see how they're similar, but also how they're different. You can do one-shot generalization, right? By learning, we mean the problem of recognizing other instances. So consider these cases here where I'm showing you alphabets that most of you don't know before. But you can see that there's another instance in each one of these of the, of the same character that's shown up here. So for this one here, um, can you see down here where there's another instance of the same character, right? Just um, raise your hand when I get to it. 
<laughs> Somewhere around there, yeah, okay. All right, there you go. Um, so yeah, how are you able to do that? Okay, well, um, it, uh, this, is, this is quite a hard problem. Uh, if you take the, the kind of standard network, so people are almost perfect at this, you know, the error rate of just a couple of percent. Um, if you take the standard neural networks, for example, that were optimized to do the handwritten digit problem and just sort of take them and, and scale them up to a much bigger set of classes, you know, they'll do pretty well, but their error rate might be something like 10%. Um, and you know, that's, that's 10 times worse <laughs> than you. So what's the gap? Well, here's, here's one way, to, a, a slightly different way to think about it, which is think about how you would draw this character, right? So just kind of draw this in the air in front of you. Right, so you probably did something like this. These are six participants in our experiments. And effectively, what we've been doing in this work, this is what Brendan did for his thesis, is to try to build a model of how you do that as a kind of Bayesian inference, basically. Now, we call this Bayesian program learning because the kind of model that we're building here is what's called a probabilistic program. And this is a word that probabilistic program, people use the, that word in different ways, and I'm sure some of you might use that in your own work, and some of you might use it differently from us. But the, what we mean is, think of this as like a generalization of a directed graphical model. So like a Bayesian network or other kinds of directed graphical probability models, there's um, conditional dependencies which have intuitively a causal structure. In this case, they're actually meant to capture our human intuitions about the actual causal structure, so how you would actually draw a character. And there's several different levels to this model, and I'm not going to go into the details, but the basic thing is the model is meant to capture the causal process in, in a way that respects the compositionality or the programs and subprograms or subroutines. So like in the case of drawing, it's sort of the strokes and the substrokes, the basic gestures, and how they're glued together into what we call an action program. It's a, it's a probabilistic program in the sense that every time you run it, let's say every time you run this program for uh, here, you get a different execution. These are three different outputs of running that program three different times, and that captures the variability in the class. And the idea is to see one instance of a character make some guess at what that program is, such that if you were to rerun it different times, you could get you could capture the variability, and now you have a tool for doing, yes, if you like pattern recognition, but a, but a deeper understanding, and I'll show you one side of slightly deeper thing you can do with this. Of course, this, you can only do this if you have a very strongly structured prior and hypothesis space reflecting some kind of ideas about how drawings work, and that's, that's part of the way this model is built. But, but it, the, in, in high-level picture, you have this structured probabilistic model, and you basically turn it around with Bayes' rule and a bunch of algorithms for doing that, and then I'll show you just sort of the, the, an example of what you might do with this, which because it's a generative model, you, you not only can classify at human level, but you can, you can sample from it and say, okay, give me some other instances of this class, and we can turn this into a little Turing test here. So here what I'm, what I'm showing you is one instance of a character which we gave to people and also to our model, and we said, make up another instance. Don't copy it, just draw another one. And now the question is for you, can you tell which, nine, which array of nine in each case was drawn by the humans versus the model? It's pretty hard to tell, but see if you can. It's different in each case, right or left, I don't even remember actually, but uh, okay, well, uh, um, I'll, tell, I'll show you the answer. You tell me if you got it right, okay. Did anybody get it all right? No, probably most of you got about three right, if I had to guess. Um, <laughs> how about here? <laughs> anybody get it, can you see? Okay, here's the right answer. So people are mostly at chance in recognizing humans versus machines here, which is a sign that our model has passed this very, very simple version of a Turing test. Okay. Um, now there's lots of other things you can do with this idea. I'm not really going to go into the details, but we're currently trying to apply this to other kinds of concept learning problems, learning about objects. Um, another area where there's been interesting comparisons between AI and humans recently is in learning to play games like classic Atari video games, where again, you know, you've, if, if, if you don't work in this area, you probably still have heard of, for example, machines that can learn to play video games at human level. But the current machines based on reinforcement learning take hundreds or thousands of hours of gameplay to do that. With fast enough computers and big enough clusters, you can, you can do those thousand hours of gameplay very, very quickly, maybe in just um, an hour or less of real time. But it's effectively in human time, much more than any kid would ever play a game before they got uh, sick of it and moved on to something else. So we've been trying to capture how you can get you know, from the current learning curves in deep learning, which are 100 hours or so, um, to the, hu the human learning curves in these games, which are much more like about 10 minutes. 
using similar ideas of basically looking at a game like this and assembling a program to describe how the game works, but also maybe the policies for uh, succeeding at the game. And that, that's going to just turn me to the second part of, of the talk here, um, which is the, the problem of what we call common sense scene understanding. I think what you were seeing if you were watching that video game in the upper right before was a version of it. Another way to see it is what's going on with this baby over there. I'm going to show you two one and a half year olds. And there's a scene understanding problem of, for you watching the video, but put yourself in the position of this kid who's looking at these cups here and doing a thing that many kids like to do, which is to stack them up into some interesting configuration. Right? He's looking at the objects around him. He's thinking about what he can do. Um, if you uh, watch the video for a while, you'll notice that he's basically going to be trying to make a stack of two blocks, well, you can see it there, that he's going to put on the other two. And, and he's just going to keep going. And it's just, just quite an amazing thing. Like, again, if, if you know anything about the state of the art in robotics, I think you would agree that no robot can do anything like that. And if one could, it would be quite amazing. right? So how do you look at objects and make sense of what you can do with them like that? Or this, um, now think about the one and a half year old in the back there. This is from a famous experiment by Felix Warnikin and Tomasello. The kid sees an action that you, he's never seen before and that you haven't seen before unless you watch this video. And yet somehow he knows what's going on and what to do to help out. So watch what the kid does. He goes and opens and looks inside. That, that maybe the, that's the best part right about there. So, so how does he figure that out, right? How can he understand what that person's goal is and how to help him? Again, if we could build robots that could do that without having to be instructed, like that kid didn't have to be instructed, it would be amazing. So we build models like the ones I'm showing here to try to capture what's going on inside even these young kids' heads. Now, I'm drawing them as something like graphical models. So this model of intuitive physics over here, it looks like a hidden Markov model, a standard graphical model depiction, right? But we have what we call thick nodes and arrows. So what's inside the world state or what's inside these arrows are not just vectors and matrices, but struct data structures and algorithms. And that's the sense in which these are probabilistic programs. So uh, you know, I can't go into all of the details, but think of probabilistic programming languages as ways to extend the probabilistic inference and hierarchical probabilistic inference toolkit to, capture, to use tools from symbolic knowledge representation to, to be able to handle much richer kinds of common sense. And increasingly, weaving neural networks in here to try to learn in a pattern recognition sense, to try to learn uh, what we sometimes call amortized inference or patterns in data that can give you approximate posterior samples from this what would otherwise be an incredibly hard inference problem uh, you know, in reasonable time. It's, it's very much analogous to what you saw in the last talk, actually. Think of, so what you saw there was a physical, physically constrained, very difficult inverse inference problem. And we have the same kind of thing going on here. The physics we capture using these things called game engine programs. So the, some of the particular programs we take from, say, the graphics engines or the physical simulators um, or planning programs that are used by game designers to you know, not actually capture the way real optics works or real physics, but just make things that look good, look good enough, and support real-time interaction. And by embedding those as basically the structure of these generative models, we, this, is our, this is how we're beginning to capture these common sense probabilistic inferences. So just in the inverse graphic setting, here's some recent work that was just submitted by Ilker Yildirim, who's a postdoc in my lab and also works with Vinrick Freewald at Rockefeller. I put this slide in here because it's directly analogous to some of these inverse problems that you, were, you, you just saw. This is now a, 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 basically a model that's trying to capture how the brain, this is the macaque monkey brain, recognizes faces. How do you see an image, that little thing on the left? And we, we understand this, or we've come to understand this as a kind of an inverse problem. It's an inverse graphics problem. So there's no physics in here yet. But you take a, basically a graphics pipeline for um, generating faces with 3D structure and texture. And we used to try to solve this the way you saw in the last talk, where we like, kind of hypothesize and check. At, and with basically MCMC type algorithms, we could do a, a, a stochastic search in the space of graphics uh, programs until we find one that renders into the image. And you can do that reasonably fast, but not nearly as fast as your brain does it. So we built a kind of a neural network that's called an efficient inverse graphics network that learns from self-generated data to solve approximately this inverse problem. 
And I won't go into the details, but just again to resonate with the last talk, we make similar kinds of similarity matrices, but these ones here are measured from the brain by Vinrick Freewald and Doris Sow, and they correspond to several different stages of the, 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 the face processing pipeline in what's called the ventral stream, which is kind of going along roughly the bottom of the brain. You have this in the human brain as well. Okay. And then we can, we can compare the, the representations of our model that's learned to invert this, and really we, you know, we've, we've been able to get quite a striking fit to those things using a combination of the top-down part as the graphics and then a neural net which learns to invert that to do approximate inference instead of having to do top-down Monte Carlo. And it does a lot better, actually, than um, uh, what's, what you're seeing here is this is the VGG face model, which is a state-of-the-art neural network for face recognition developed uh, now by people in Google, Andrew Zisserman's group. This model works really well for certain kinds of face recognition problems, but the inverse, uh, the, or the model that learns to do inverse graphics actually corresponds better to what's going on in your brain. The same kinds of ideas can be used to build this, now to add in physics, so to add in dynamics and to capture something of say, when people look at these scenes here, we ask, well, how likely is this stack of locks to fall? And here's an example of doing an experiment where we ask people to judge a whole bunch of these different tower configurations, and we compare that to our model, um, which is the predictions on the x-axis. What is the model? The model is basically just the average of a small number of samples where we first done the inverse graphics part, and then we, we take the, the, the state estimate, which is again a 3D model, like configuration of objects, think of something like a CAD model of blocks, um, but it has some uncertainty because we're not exactly sure where the blocks are, and we propagate that uncertainty through a game physics engine and take a few of those samples, and that's what, that's what gives our prediction here about how likely or how much of the tower uh, will fall. And the same kind of thing can be used to answer many, many different questions. There's no training in here. There's just probabilistic inference, OK? The, the, the only learning would, that, that goes on in this kind of model is learning to invert very, very fast to solve this inverse problem. This is just the, the, probab the physics part just comes from sort of forward propagation through the generative model. I'm just going to illustrate this with this task here, but for reasons of time, I'll just kind of skip that. But these are just windows into one of these game physics engines where, where we ask, what would happen if you bumped the table and knocked some of the objects onto the floor? Would it be more red or yellow ones, for example? And that's just showing you how we're able to model what might be sort of, sort of unusual tasks, but this probabilistic physics engine can do, again, a very good job of capturing how you're able to solve these inference problems that maybe you've never seen before. Or to come back to this problem here, well, how, how, do, how, how do we see this kind of action understanding with probabilistic programs? Well, now the programs are like planning programs. I mean, again, basically like classical expected utility models that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, whether or not human decision making is really based on maximizing expected utility, we can understand how even kids understand human decision making as a kind of what we call naive utility calculus. So he watches somebody's actions, thinks about the cost of the actions, and tries to figure out possible rewards. And that's a way of working backwards from observed actions in some world state to make an inference about, say, an agent's desires. And so we, 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 here, we, here the way we test these models is we show people scenes like this, and we say, can you figure out which of the 16 objects on the table she's reaching for? See, this is in slow motion, but see if you can figure out when she's reaching. Probably maybe about now is about when you might have been able to see. And that's, th that's what you're seeing here is the predictions of our models, which is basically doing a Bayesian inference over possible goals. The same kind of thing can be applied at a multi-agent setting to figure out why, say, this person here looks like they're helping somebody, and this person here doesn't look like they're helping, but sort of the opposite. So think about utility functions now for one agent, which can depend on another agent's utility. And that's how we model how people are able to infer these helpful social interactions. Um, there's, with, especially with my colleague Nancy Kamwisher, we've worked on really she and her, and her students, like Jason Fisher, or Sarah Schwetman or uh, Leila Ishik have studied the brain systems. And I, I, don't, I won't tell you any details, except we can just say there are, there are certain chunks of the brain which my colleagues are able to map out where we think this is where the intuitive physics engine is implemented, or this is where some of the social inference engine that we're talking about has been implemented. And then with people like Vinrick Freewald, the same guy who I showed you with the face stuff there before, he studies monkeys. So we can go in and actually with him, I mean, he, he's doing the hard work here, record from neurons in a much more fine-grained way to give representational maps ideally, of how intuitive physics and intuitive psychology work in the brain. That's the, this is all research that we're doing together as part of another big NSF center, which is the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. Um, 
and, the, and the last part of that NSF uh, research program is studying this in young children, in babies. So I showed you at the beginning these one and a half year olds. And the reason why I did that is not just, I mean, it's cute and, <laughs> and inspiring, but ultimately we want to be able to study the origins of these computations. So it's important that we can do experiments like this one here with our colleagues uh, Arno Teglis and Luca Bonatti, where we can actually show the same kinds of intuitive physics uh, demonstrations to babies, measure data from them, which is how long they look, which is a measure of surprise. When we show them different kinds of physical outcomes, the ones which are more or less surprising, infants will look longer at. And then we can relate that to the probability under our probabilistic physics engine. Or an analogous kind of thing, this is, this is done by Sherry Liu in Liz Spelke's lab at Harvard, again, another one of our center partners, studying infants. This is just actually 10-month-olds, infants' intuitive psychology. So what makes one of these characters here there's, there's a soundtrack which you're not hearing. It's a little more engaging with the sound. But how, you know, based on the cost of an action, jumping over a wall or rolling up a hill or jumping over a gap, and by varying the cost, infants seeing these different displays will make different inferences about how much an agent values something. And, and the final question, which is just totally future work that I'll leave you with, is how might you learn or build these systems? Right? This is a very hard problem of learning. It's not like learning in a neural net or most other conventional machine uh, learning systems where you can write down some kind of nice optimization landscape or even sort of nice optimization landscape, right? Searching in the space of simulation programs is incredibly difficult and nobody knows how to solve it. Um, you know, again, you can take at the sort of top-down kind of approach that, that we saw in the last talk and perhaps that is actually the way learning works either in the course of a child's life or over evolution, it might be why these things take so long to build. Right? Actually building an intuitive physics engine is not one-shot learning. It's more like lifelong learning. But it also builds heavily on evolutionary experience. So going forward, the kind of approach we're following, you can think of it as learning as programming, or we're really excited about work that's going on between our lab and colleagues in CSAIL like Armando Solar Lazama, who works in programming languages and program synthesis, where we try to capture all the ways that you might, as a human programmer, try to improve your code and say, can we make learning algorithms that do that automatically as a model of, in some sense, how a child might learn to program their own brain? So just to conclude then, I've tried to give you an overview of a research program, in a sense, trying to understand what kind of statistics or data science is human intelligence, how it goes beyond pattern recognition, some places where we can study that in a tractable way. Some of the tools we're using, like these ideas of probabilistic programs, game engine programs, and so on, a little bit about program synthesis, and really looking ahead to how we're, we're hoping to build uh, systems, you know, again, this is a long vision. This is not like the, the five-year plan. This is the 10 or 20 or plus year plan. How we can really try to make good on what was really the, the oldest early idea of AI, building a machine that learns about the world the way a human child does. Thanks. Yeah. You talked about how a human child learns. But we think that adults learn in a quite different way. So you want to comment on how that changes over time and what, what your model? Oh, so, so the question is, how does a child learn and how does an adult learn? Well, well I'm mean, not sure what you mean when you say adults learn in a different way. I mean, um, many ways they learn in different ways. <laughs> like learning is complicated. And you know, I only talked about learning. So I gave two little bits about learning. One is I talked about one-shot learning, and then I said all these other ways that learning is programming. You know, as far as I understand, both young children and adults do all of those things. I think the main difference is that children just have a lot more to learn, and they, uh, they spend a lot more of their time learning than adults. Um, but I don't, I, don't, I don't know that our naive intuitions about how adults or children learn, I don't know what, what those are worth exactly. I think when you actually go and do um, you know, controlled experiments, which some of my colleagues do, you know, you, you don't, I, don't, I don't know that you see fundamental differences, at least of the kind of things that we're talking about. In all these cases, learning is you know, a kind of thinking. And um, you know, that's, uh, that's something that's human. There's a question. So, uh you mentioned one-shot learning, yeah. and then you mentioned uh, 40,000 hours of gameplay, <laughs> and then you mentioned a few shots of learning. Yeah. So between one shot and small number of shots, do you yeah. have an insight about if there's actually a nice... Uh, yeah, well, so, so the kind of work problems? that we're doing, and it's, it's in progress, this is work that Pedro Civitas, who's a PhD student uh, working with me and, and some others, um, 
is basically trying to trying to do what's much more like one-shot learning for, for games. But, I mean, if you actually remember playing simple Atari games, uh, it, it doesn't take a human thousands of hours. You do, I mean, you, you, you might, if, you, if you were just watching that game, the one called Frostbite there, if you were paying attention, you, you, there were a number of one-shot learning episodes that happened either unconsciously or consciously, I can guarantee you, in your brain, where you saw, oh, I do this, I touch this, then this happens, I touch this, and this happens. So the idea of the models we're building is to assemble, basically, a bunch of one-shot learning episodes of little program fragments into something like a simplified game engine program that then the agent can use to plan out their actions. And it's, it relates to the thing I just said at the end about the, the, you know, the child as coder or learning as programming, just like, just like that, right? A, what a lot of programming is, is you make, you assemble small pieces, each one in, in a sense a kind of one-shot event. I write this function, I write that function, I debug this function, right? It's, it's discrete moments, but you assemble those together into a larger system of knowledge that we might call a big program or a system or a code base. And that's, that's more the way we're starting to think about uh, human learning computationally. We have one last question. Hi. Um, so I just want to make sure that I understand this correctly. Uh -huh. When you talk about one-shot learning, for example, um, it seems like success is completely contingent on you having the right structure to actually learn. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, for one-shot learning. That, right. I, yeah, of course. So uh, what's the next step, right? Because it seems like you are introducing however much experience you have over your lifetime to yes. say this is what matters for learning on this one shot. But yes. how do yeah. you begin to make that next? Uh, right. Well, I, 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 I think maybe this is what you're gesturing to is the next step would be the previous step in a sense of like, can you explain where did that knowledge come from? Yeah, that's right. So that's the kind of thing that we and others are currently working on. Um, you know, in, in a number of different domains. So in the case, I mean, I think the handwriting or how, how we learn handwritten characters is it's a little mini domain, but it is a nice representative one to study. And one of the things we're working on there is both experiments and models for that. So on the experimental side, we're studying actually how two and three year olds write these characters because they're the ones who are building the that the sort of more general schema or abstract knowledge that now as adults, we have to be able to do that one shot problem. And, you know, I can tell you based on some preliminary data, um, three-year-olds, like, you know, three-year-olds, uh, when they do, when, when they are asked to do that same drawing thing that, that you do, they're not that different from adults, four-year-olds especially. So, you know, depends on the three-year-olds. But two-year-olds, you know, you, you, you show it to them and they're just like scribbling all over the place. Now, that doesn't mean that inside their head it's a scribble all over the place. And part of what we're trying to do is to figure out what's going on inside their head because there's pretty good reason to think what's inside their head is more advanced than what they can do with their, their, um, their hands and their pen. But then we, we're also trying to build models which are trying to induce some of the more abstract structure and see if that can capture the kind of learning that we might see in those two, three, and four-year-olds. Okay. Thanks. Oh.